Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to Afro Space with me, Adetun Motola, and my co-host, Inyasha Grace. Afro Space is a show that brings you issues and happenings around the continent of Africa, from politics to business, lifestyle, and culture. Today we have joining us from Guinea Conakry, a lady by the name of Diaka Kamara. Diaka Kamara is a, man, a woman, rather, of many parts. She's a TV host, a journalist, an activist. She's also the founder of the Diaka Kamara Foundation that is looking seriously at reducing the level of illiteracy in Guinea, especially with a focus around young girls. Welcome to Afro Space Diaka. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. You're very welcome. Okay, all right. All right. Okay, my first question is going to talk about your professional history. And um, as Adetunji has already highlighted, you wear a couple of, a couple of hats. Uh, you're a journalist, an activist, a TV host, a producer, content creation, creator. Um, how do you juggle all of these roles? And um, perhaps tell us which one really does pull on your heartstrings the most and give you the most joy. Well, you know, I think that all these roles uh, complement each other, you know, because they say as a journalist, you are always looking uh, for the truth. As an activist, you are also always looking to bring that truth to light in order to change uh, people's lives. And as a content creator, it also, you know, showcase that truth and highlight, you know, the things that people are going through every day. So to me, I think all of these hats, like you say, complement each other. They go hand in hand, you know. So, and, and uh, I would say that my favorite hat to wear would be the, the activist side part of it. Because I think there is no greater reward than knowing you have positively changed or affected someone's life, you know. And that's done through actions, no matter how small or little, but that can have a real powerful impact on someone's life. To me, it's amazing when, when, when I, I meet a parent who said, oh my God, because of you, my daughter is going to school, you know. There's, it's priceless. So I will say that the, the, being an activist to, uh, for me has, it's, it's more fulfilling, it's more rewarding, you know, than, than, than anything else because we really do have the, the, the capability to, to change someone's life, you know, by just one simple act of kindness, one, one can even say. So. Mm. Now, you are from uh, Guinea. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you are from uh, Guinea. Uh, Yaka, your country is uh, famous. Uh, your first president, Ahmed Sokoture, was a leading light in uh, African uh, Renaissance, Pan Africanism. And in fact, uh, in the 60s, in the mid 60s, when Kwame Nkrumah was removed from power, he was uh, hosted by uh, Ahmed Sokoture and also made co president of Guinea. Um, please tell our viewers uh, Guinea doesn't really get a lot of. Uh, um, oxygen in the in the media. Can you tell us a little bit about the great country of Guinea? What's so unique um, about it? Uh, first of all, Guinea is one of the most beautiful countries in the world. Yes, it's, I'm not saying that because I'm Guinean. It's 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 actually true. And 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 I remember as a student at uh, the University of Houston in Texas, in my African American studies, we studied. Ahmed Sekoutoure, you know, as one of the, the great uh, Pan-African leaders. And to me, I was so proud of that. And I think that with uh, a lot of African countries, our history is always uh, muddied, if you will. And of course, we have 
the good parts and we have the bad parts. But I think it's important as African that we control the narrative of our, our stories, and which is one of the reasons that I actually became a content creator is that to create content that tell our stories in a truthful and authentic way. When we talk about Sekuture, you will see some people that will, that will uh, paint him as this, this dictator, you know? And then, but we, have, we do have to remember that he has done a lot, not only for Guinea, but also for Africa, even South Africa. We ended up fighting, you know, to help and apartheid in, in, in South Africa. So Guinea is a very, has a very complex history because it's important also not to uh, diminish people's feeling about the history of the country, you know. But it is very important for me as a Guinean to really talk, talk about my country as a... Has a, has a leading example in, the, in, in our region because we were one of the first countries to, be, uh, to have our independence in, in, in the 1950s. And I think that, 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 uh, that gave other countries the will and the drive to follow our lead, you know. And when we speak about Guinea, we often don't speak about the good things in Guinea. Because if you look at the media today, you talk about politics, everything is about politics. Oh, this is happening, this is happening. But I don't tell you, you know, the, 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 the wealth of the country, you know, when in terms of human resources, in terms of natural resources, you know. And, 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 and to me, Guinea has so much potential. It, it does. It's one of the richest, natural richest, uh, richest countries uh, in Africa. It has so much, put, so many, so much potential. And I think that slowly but surely we are, you know, starting to emerge. We are really putting in place infrastructures. We are uh, really working to develop the country. And you will find that there is a saying that I say that Guinea does not attract you, but it keeps you. You talked about Kwame, uh, uh, um, Kwame uh, Kuruma, who, who came to Guinea. I dare you to visit my country. You will never want to leave because that's the magic of the country. It's a beautiful country. It's filled with very warm people, very loving people. And it's a country that has a lot of potential. I think we have, you know, we are a little late in the things that we could have achieved by now after being independent for 60 years, but we are really starting to take off. And I believe like the next few years or so, we're really, you know, we're going to see a country that is really uh, regaining its place, you know, on, 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 on in, in the world stage. So, yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, yes. your, passion your passion for for, for for your country and just the positivity that you exude about it is really, really contagious. And uh, I wish we could all get on a plane right now and visit. But, uh, tell us about your life story a little bit more. Um, you were born in Belgium and studied in the U.S. and now you do live in Guinea. I want to understand. What about, what about your multi-national experiences has shaped you to be what you are today? I mean, the way you speak really passionately about your country, um, um, that your your awareness, awareness of your country, country is a very deep thing. thing. Having having other countries, how, how have you found that? Or how, how have you owned that and become, become really, really positive, positive about it? Positive about Jenny. Jenny. I think it all starts, um, for me, I've always been proud of who I am. I'm proud of my parents, so therefore I'm proud of where they're from. So therefore I am proud of where I'm from. And I, it's true, I was born in Belgium and did uh, some of my childhood in Guinea and then the rest in America. And one of the things that I loved the most in America, one of the first thing I learned, is to be patriotic. Mm. When the American tells you, I'm an American, you feel the pride, you feel the patriotism be behind that world and the, the word, and they are ready to lay down their life for the country. So mm. I think 
that's what America did for me. It's installed in me this deep sense of patriotism. I'm like, yeah, you know, these people are so proud of the country. Good or bad, it doesn't matter. But they are proud. They say it with so much uh, 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 um, pride, you know. I mean, they have their own problems too. <laughs> that despite the fact it's America, they still have the But the American, it's so proud to say I'm an American. I'm like, yeah, I'm a Guinean too, you know. I'm proud of my country. I'm proud of my roots. And I've never forgotten where I came from. And I've to always told myself, I came to America to study. I will always go back home. Well, they say you don't go back home. But I never intended to stay in Europe or in America. I always intended to come back home to Guinea and shape my country. Because, you know, it's so easy to sit somewhere and be like, oh, yeah, there's, not, there's no electricity. There's not this. There's not that. It doesn't work. It's so easy to sit somewhere and just criticize all day long. But at the end of the day, like JFK said, what are you doing for your country? Mm. You know, so I told myself, okay, I will, I'm going to go back home. I'm going to learn. I'm going to have a good education, but I'm going to go back home and try to use what I learned here back home, trying to better my, my country, trying to make it, you know, the elder rather that I wish it for it to be. And that's the only way we can change Africa is when people like us go back home and work with the people that probably didn't even leave the country, but if we work together, we can bring from what we can bring what we learn overseas and and put it, you know, to what it's already there and create these beautiful spaces, this beautiful heaven for ourselves. So, mm. uh, I, I the diversity, the different culture, different places I've been has only contributed to mold me and 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 to really make me the patriotic person that I am today because at the end of the day I think that if you love your country you when I moved to Guinea I remember in 2011 but I didn't have electricity mm. you know and imagine I I'm living the USA I'm living Texas to move to Guinea when there was no electricity now we have electric we had electricity like one day every three days we had one from like from like 6 p.m to midnight you know so can you imagine if you don't love your country that would be like a big sacrifice to make mm. but to me i i always thought that you know no sacrifice is big enough for our countries mm. not you know and that's what you learn in, in, in America, you know, these people look at the soldier, they're ready to lay down their lives to protect their freedom, whatever definition of it that they have, you know, that's not what's important, but it's that they believe so much in their country that they're willing to do anything for it. So it's the same mentality that, you know, inhabits me. And I think that as an African, if we love our countries, believe me, Africa would be like such a wonderful place, you know. So, Diaka, you've uh, been in uh, production. You've done quite a lot of work, documentaries. You even did, uh, is it One Saves 100 with Ebola? Uh, a few years ago, I believe in 2014, you do some work for the BBC, BBC Africa, under, you know, your journalistic hat. But there's a top 10 show that you have in Guinea, right? And, uh, you know, can you tell our viewers what's, what that is about? Because when just the word top 10 already tells us that it's a top production. So give us, give our viewers a sense of your top 10 show. What is it about? Uh, like I said, I grew up in, 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 in the United States. So all my uh, TV repairs are American TV show. So top 10 is actually based, is, is inspired by 106 and Park where you count down the 10 hardest music videos. And I remember when I used to come during summer vacation in Guinea, you have these kids, because of radio, they had like the latest hits, but they didn't have the latest music videos. They couldn't see the music videos. We didn't have internet as we have it today, you know. YouTube was not even accessible to, 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 to Guinea back then. And so I told myself, okay, I'm going to create a TV show that will bring them those latest videos. You don't have to pay cable expensive cable in order to see Little Wayne's latest video and also give this platform to, to promote Guinean artists first and then African artists because to me 
I always tell myself the only difference between the Sul Banks, which is a Guinean artist, and a Chris Brown is that Chris Brown was born in America, Sul Banks was born in Guinea. And I was right because Sul Banks ended up being signed by Sony Records. Mm -hmm. He's the first Guinean artist to be signed by Sony Records. So it's not about talent, it's just about a platform. So the objective behind Top 10 was to give Guinean artists a platform to showcase their talent, you know, and also bring them the latest music videos you can be in a village back you know in in yomu and still see the newest Nicki Minaj video so that was the objective and 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 also to create content that was quality that that was of quality because the Guinean TV station before I started top 10 was it was like looking at the 1960 TV, you know? But then you understand, when you produce in Africa, it's very difficult because production uh, requires means, you know? Mm. And TV stations don't have money to finance production. You have to go get sponsorship with different, you know, uh, businesses in order to produce. So there's so many factors that goes into it. But I always told myself, if I'm gonna start creating content I'm gonna make content that can play, that has the same quality as any content that we see on MTV, BET, Canal, doesn't matter. If I cannot do it right, I already, I already not started. So that's how Top 10 was born. And I remember my French was so bad. Like, and I spoke Franglais, which, is mean, which means French English, which was, which was more English than French. Like, I'm here having a conversation, you know, oh, yeah, yes, bienvenue dans votre émission top 10. We're going to count down the 10 hardest music videos. <laughs> on the video for 100, you know, je suis Jacques Camara. Or, you know, on va vous présenter. Uh, uh, yeah, number nine, we have little weight. So, you know, it was more English <laughs> than French. But it became extremely popular. You know, it was the first TV show to air in high definition and it was on the national TV station. Mm. So at first people were like, oh my God, she's trying to Americanize the TV station, you know, she's trying to like uh, bring the American culture mm. to, 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 to Guinea and all of that. And I'm like, but no, you know, uh, television is about cultural diversity, you know, in America, they watch shows, African shows, you know, they watch shows that talk about Africa. So there's no reason that we cannot merge both because it was really a platform that put, because the Guinean artists that I will receive as guests sang in local languages, you know, Susu, Fula, Mandingo. It was really, really, really local Guinean artists. But then the show aired on, on the national TV station, which was on satellite, which was on canal, and they were seen around the world, you know, mm. through the show because the show was attractive and attractive viewership so it became the most popular show in guinea and that's where the celebrity if you will you know started with top 10 so it's my little baby it will be 10 years that i've been wow. next year 2021 yes and wow. it's so difficult because i've been trying to get someone else to host so whenever I try to put other people, you know, to host, mm. they call me, I get messages, you know, oh my God, no, why aren't you hosting? And the objective or for me is for top 10 to last beyond the other camera, beyond my image. You know, I want to see top 10 20 years from now, you know, and I cannot be hosting top 10 forever in a day. So I'm trying to gradually get other people to, to, to host, uh, uh, you know, the show. So that's the story of, of Top And then, I mean, I a, a really great story and a great success story for that. And um, on, on conversations about your content creation, uh, Adetunji did mention one of the documentaries that you did in 2014, which was titled uh, One Saves 100, which was um, profiling the Ebola uh, epidemic at the time. Are you likely to produce like anything to for COVID-19? Um, what is the story to tell about COVID-19 for Guinea? Uh, COVID-19, I've done some sensibilization campaign and I'm actually uh, thinking about doing also a documentary because I think that through documentaries, we um, when you look at COVID-19, I don't think you have that much impact in Guinea has other, even our neighboring countries because of what we went through with Ebola. You know, we had the experience of Ebola. And the objective of doing One, Save, One Saves 100 was first of all, 
to uh, sensibilize the population because when Ebola started in Guinea, the communication was really, you telling people that have ate, you know, this, uh, this uh, wild meat for 60 years that they cannot eat it. Why? Because there's this disease, you know, that they cannot bury their dead. Why? Because there's this disease. So it was very difficult for them to comprehend and believe that, it, that the, the disease was even real. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Mm. So the objective of the documentary was to, to get victims or, and survivors of Ebola to testify, but victims that they knew. It's easier for you to believe your neighborhood, your taxi cab driver, you know, the woman that sells you meat at the market when she tells you, oh, Ebola has killed seven members of my family, than someone you don't know telling you, oh yeah, giving you like a, 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 a schematics of how the disease kills and all of that. So that was the whole point of, 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 of the documentary. And with COVID-19, we took it more seriously. Like, we're like, uh-uh, we are playing. Because like in Guinea, I think we have 37 or 40 deaths, if I'm not mistaken, which is really low, mm -hmm. you know? So, and the story that I would love to tell with the, 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 the COVID-19 is how it has impacted people's lives, you know, how we have rethought the way we do things, mm. the way we work. Because yeah, like for us being, you know, entrepreneurs, being at, at a certain level, how it has impact, up, impacted it is different than the woman that goes to the market to mm. sell her fruits mm. or to sell her meat. Do you see what I'm saying? Or the, the entrepreneur, the, the informal entrepreneurs in the street trying to, to make ends meet while there's this disease that is preventing people from even uh, 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 frequenting places like markets. Do you see what I'm saying? Or uh, preventing people from, 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 from regrouping. Because here in Guinea with the, with the, with the sanitary uh, um, urgent, you cannot be more than 20 people somewhere, you know? So the story I will tell with COVID is how it has impacted people's life and how we have redefined our new normal in Guinea. Mm. That's what I will. Uh, that's what I will be interested in in, in 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 making a documentary out of. You know. Mm. Right now, Diaco, um, I've been look, doing some research about Guinea, um, especially around the levels of illiteracy, and it's quite high. It's almost about seventy percent. And I yes. know that uh, it's the population, I think it's mostly like Senegal, a Muslim country, about 85% Muslim. But the research also said that uh, it was only in the 1980s that steps began to be taken to address the issue of girls' education. In fact, some of the statistics that I saw talked about low levels of uh, enrollment of girls in secondary school as low as about 21%. Now, you've gone ahead to set up the Diaka Kamara Foundation in order to be able to reduce the high levels of illiteracy in Guinea, but also to focus on young girls. Can you give our viewers a sense of what the DCF, the Diaka Kamara Foundation, has been doing, what you have achieved so far, and what you're planning to do going forward? Um, the Diaka Kamara Foundation for Education, because I believe that the social economical development of our countries can only happen through education, which is why it is my fight. And especially the scholarization of young girls. And we live in a country, in a country where the society is patri 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 patriarchal society, which means it's a man's world, you know? And often enough, the little girls are reduced to staying at home, doing house, household chores, you know, helping out while the boys go to school. Also, the girls are married often enough, young, before the age of 18. So my fight has been really to raise the literacy rate, to really focus on education and, and to create this culture of excellence. It's like work hard, study hard and it will pay off. So throughout the foundation, we've had, uh, we, the first thing, the first action we did was actually take 100 of the best and brightest students in very poor school areas, you know, and reward them for being the best out of those schools, you know. 
We, were, we rewarded them with, uh, with, with uh, uh, kids, you know, uh, school kids, computers, mm. uh, 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 shoes. And some of them, the ones that were really like in, in high school, we even found a, a, a internship for them, for the people that were supposed to be headed to college. And we have also really focused, because you're talking about education, but we don't have libraries. You know, even when there's exams, you see students go into the airport to study because it's, it's, there's light, you know. So you need to create spaces where students can go and learn, when, where people can go learn. So one of our major, major uh, uh, fight for the foundation is really to go and, first of all, our ultimate goal is to build a library, like a modern day library, like the one I... I had when I went to U of H, you know? Mm. So, but that's a very huge project. In the meantime, what are we doing? We're going into uh, public schools, asking them to give us a space, you know, where we renovate and we create libraries, you know? So the students of this school can have access to books, to learning, and also, uh, because the thing is you have the student finishing high school, they've never used a computer. They don't know how Microsoft works. They go to college and they finish college. So it's more practical than theoretical. So the objective is to give the student in these different schools, you know, uh, 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 lessons in Microsoft so that they know how to use a computer. They know how to write up a resume. They know how to, you know, be prepared. Because today, when you look at the, the, the new technology, the antiques, it's all about digitalizations, you know, it's all numerical. And in Guinea, we, we do have that disadvantage where that is not incorporated into the, into the learning system. And we also finance, um, because when I talk about education, it's not just going to college, you know, or, or getting like a formal education. There's also learning skill, you know, there's vocational schools. So we've worked with different association here in Guinea to, 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 to form like a, a, a woman in rural area in, in, in making soap, in, in learning how to sew, you know, so they can have a skills that they can, they can use to really better their lives. So those are the type of stuff we, the foundation has been doing and for, but for COVID, we did something special because like I said, it was very difficult for these entrepreneurs to be able to make ends meet when all the businesses, everything is closed. People are staying home to really uh, uh, stop the spread of the virus. So we did a Teleton where we, let, where we raised around $100,000 to buy food and, and, and distribute it for, to 500 families, so roughly 5,000 people on a period, on a three month period to help them out. So we gave them food kits, rice, wow. milk, um, oil, so they can like, you know, uh, uh, hold on for this period of time and be able to, you know, uh, 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 be able to feed their family. Yeah, so absolutely. yeah, our main focus is education, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we do not uh, every once in a while. Social impact, social impact. Exactly. It, if the needs yeah. arise and, 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 you know, because the, the objective of the foundation is to affect change in a positive way. We also finance surgery. We had this, this, this triplets that were born with the left cleft palate, which means they couldn't keep hold anything in their mouth. So we're able to find a doctor mm -hmm. uh, and, and finance the surgery so they can repair their mouths. And today the little girls are grown and, mm -hmm. and it's amazing. It's like we did that three years ago, but to this day, the parents will always send me pictures and always thank me for, you know, uh, uh, giving uh, uh, the children a normal life. So that's, this is what I call an impact, you know, mm -hmm. to really have a deep and meaningful impact. And that is the objective of the foundation is to have an impact and to, and to, and to, and to affect change positively, not only in Guinea, but throughout Africa, you know. Uh I mean, that's amazing work you're doing, Deka, and no, I'm sharing mean, the work that you're doing with your foundation really brings me to the title of your documentary, That One Saves a Hundred, and kind of this brings to mind the question of how much we could do as a continent if a whole lot more Africans came back to affect change in the way that you're doing. So my, my, my so final question my, 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 would be... What do you think do is you Africa's think? biggest challenge and how can that challenge be addressed? 
like what I said earlier, to me, Africa's big, biggest challenge is the lack of quality education. I, once again, uh, 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 we can fight all the elements that plagues Africa, whether it's hunger, disease, war, if we invest in quality uh, uh, education across uh, Africa. Africa education uh, and training programs suffer from, from, from low quality teaching and learning, as well as the inequality and, and exclusion at mm -hmm. all levels. So it's important to, to, to have good quality education accessible to everyone boys and girls because when often enough boys are are, are are schooled more often than girls and when we look at the continent girls we make up 50 percent of the population so uh, i think we really need to invest in education mm -hmm. uh, uh vocational training and and skills and which can contribute contribute to to to, to substantive and quality human resources and we if, if we have this this quality uh, 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 human capital not only we empower our population and we can fight like i said hunger disease and 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 war and all these things these things that 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 that, that plague the african continent you know it's only through education that we can really fully and completely develop uh, uh, Africa. So it's very, very, very important that that we invest in it and we invest in good quality education because I'm sorry, but knowledge, it's power. Yeah. It's the most powerful tool that we can have to change our continent, you know? So we truly, truly must invest and, and make sure that education is accessible to, to, to everyone and and not only uh, um, not only that but for it to be a very you know good education education of quality mm. you know so because at the end of the day it's human capital that develops a country mm. you know it's the human capital it's it's that the thinkers the innovators the creators you know the the, the policies that we create that change that affect change it all comes down to human capital so the more we invest in education, the more we invest in a better human capital and the better it would be for our, 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 our continent. When you look at Rwanda, look at it. It's a perfect example of what yeah. Africa can and should be, you know, but it, it, they invested in education, they invested in human, in human capital and, 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 and look at it. So if they can, we can too, everyone can, you know. Thank you so much, uh, Diaka, for your insights on Guinea, on uh, your work, your sterling work in helping girls in Guinea to, you know, raise their profile through education. As I say, if you educate a, a woman or a girl, you educate a nation. And we also know that some of the most powerful nations on earth are countries with great educational institutions, when people talk about Oxford, Harvard, Cambridge, Yale, and so on. But in Africa, our own universities, we don't even, we can't even name them on one hand because we don't promote those universities. And there are great universities in Africa from the east to the west, to the north, to the south, where we are. So we thank you for coming onto Afro Space to give us a sense of Guinea. We've heard so much about Guinea. And today you've given us even more to salivate about, and we're looking forward to coming to Conakry and other parts of Guinea. And so what we do normally on Afro Space, we sign off by saying goodbye in our own African languages. I am Yoruba, so I will say Odabo. And in Hausa, which is not far from Pula, that you speak in Guinea, you'll say Segobe. And in Igbo, I'll say Kachifo. All right, and so I'll say my farewell, firstly, in my own language, which is Shona, and that is Sarai Tanaka. And in Zulu, it's, they say Sanaka, uh, and in Swahili, it is Kwaheri. And I will say in, uh, in Fula Mbimbi, in Mandinko Ambesini, and in Susu uh, Wonwali. <laughs> Wonuwali. Wonuwali. Lovely. 
Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You so Thank much. you for having me.